Okay, let me then, uh, let's officially start. The recording is indeed on, so that's good. Uh, so great, so everyone, welcome back. Uh, and welcome back to the Algebraic Geometry Seminar at Stanford. A few typical announcements before we start. Please uh, keep yourself muted unless you have something you wish to say. Uh, and if you're willing, please leave your video on too. And for those interested, there's a parallel chat in Discord. Uh, the link is going to be in Zoom chat. Uh, and uh, but, uh, but use it only if you feel like it. Some people find it distracting and others find that it helps them concentrate. Uh, the speaker will hopefully not be watching the chat. And the style of the seminar has traditionally been that people ask the speaker a lot of questions, including quite elementary ones, so please do so. Uh, the seminar is small enough that if you have a question, please unmute yourself and just ask it out loud. Don't raise your hand. Uh, and if you see a question in the discussion that you think should be asked, uh, again, just unmute yourself and ask it. Normally, Aaron is the person is good at asking questions. I suspect he won't do it as much today, or I hope he won't. Um, uh, and so that means hopefully other people will fill in uh, for him and, and play the role of Aaron in the, in the talk. So today we welcome Aaron. Uh, we always welcome Aaron, but we extra especially welcome Aaron Landsman today from Stanford. Uh, he's going to tell us about the trolley theorem, uh, about the trolley map restricted to the hyperelliptic locus. Thanks so much for the invitation, Ravi. And I think today I may end up asking more questions than usual, so we'll see. Uh, it's actually quite symmetrically nice for me to give this talk today because one of the first talks I gave at Stanford was in the student algebraic geometry seminar on the classical Torelli theorem about curves are uniquely determined by their Jacobians. So today I want to discuss some more subtle aspects of this theorem. So let me just set up some notation. So uh, the title is the Torelli talk restricted to the hyperelliptic locus. And there will be three main characters or main stacks in this talk. And there'll be HG, MG, and AG. So HG will be the moduli stack of hyperelliptic curves of genus G. Uh, and I will uh, avoid giving a precise definition now, but I encourage you to think about it as a question I posted in the Discord chat. Uh, but remember that the, the algebraically closed points are just degree two covers of P1 by smooth proper geometrically connected curves. That's HG, moduli of hyperelliptic curves. MG is the moduli stack of smooth proper curves of genus G with geometrically connected fibers. And AG is the stack of abelian, variety, abelian varieties of dimension G, which are principally polarized. And I also want to assume that G is at least three for this talk. Everything works fine in genus two, although it'll just make things a little simpler. And if you want, you can make sense in genus zero and one. But for simplicity, I'll assume genus is at least three. And now, just to set up some notation, which I'll use throughout the talk, so I have these three stacks, HG, MG, and AG, uh, HG hyperelliptic curves, MG curves, and AG abelian varieties, principally polarized, and I'll use tau G for the Torelli map, which sends a curve to its principally polarized Jacobian. Iota G is just the inclusion. This is a closed substack, HG inside MG. It's the locus of hyperelliptic curves. And phi G will be the composition. So phi G, just think of it as like the Torelli map on a hyperelliptic curve. Okay, so there's this classical theorem by Torelli, which says that tau g is injective on geometric points. So what does that mean? That means that if you have a curve, a, a curve in mg, then it's determined by its Jacobian. If you know its Jacobian, it's principally polarized Jacobian, you know the curve. Okay, so now, <laughs> although Ravi hoped I didn't ask too many questions, I'm gonna start with a question asking you, can someone tell me if this map tau g is an immersion? So in this talk by immersion, I mean a locally closed immersion uh, or a locally closed embedding. Yeah, I don't know. Please, uh, can anyone say? It is injective on geometric points. It's an immersion outside of the hyperelliptic locus because I read your abstract. Okay, well, let's, yeah, let me, let me put that. So uh, thank you for reading the abstract. Let me say that. So um, it's not an immersion on hyperelliptic curves on the hype on HG. Whoop, on HG. And that's, well, we'll see. I'll discuss this much more later because, uh, but it's related to the fact that it's not injective on tangent vectors. So if you have a map which is not injective on tangent vectors, it can't possibly be an immersion. And we'll see why soon. But let me even ask a simpler question. Uh, what about just like on an open, like 
at the generic point, is it an immersion? In other words, is a sort of, is there an, if say you like pass the complement of hyperlyptic curves, does anyone have any idea for that? Maybe you multiply one for, or you multiply sections of the canonical bundle to get sections of the square of the canonical bundle. Oh yeah, so you're talking, yeah, you're way ahead of me. You're talking about like understanding the space on tangent, on tangent no. vectors. Yeah, okay. But it could, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yes, right. it's an immersion away from the hyperlyptic locus. Is that what? Yeah, yeah. That so yeah, absolutely. That's right. So we'll understand the map on tangent spaces in terms of uh, deformation theory soon. But let me just point out this, maybe this fact is, uh, it's uh, kind of I interesting. So even though this map is injective on points and injective on tangent vectors, even in characteristic zero, any characteristic, this map is not an immersion. It's actually two to one map. So, and the reason is every abelian variety has an automorphism, namely minus one has a non-trivial automorphism, but curves only have, generic curves only have a trivial automorphism. So let me say this this way. Uh, so it's actually generically, this map tau g is generically two to one as stacks, not as core spaces, but generically two to one. It's a tall, but generically two to one. And the reason is that the generic curve, uh, again, remember I'm using genus as at least three, has one automorphism, has only the identity automorphism. But generic, but the generic member of AG has uh, minus one, plus or minus one as optimal. Right, and so somehow it's like MG is maybe generically. I don't know. Somehow it's generically a scheme, but AG is not generically a scheme. It's generically. Uh, I don't even know how to, somehow it's generically a half point because it always has this automorphism. So it's actually a generically a two to one atoll map. Not atoll, it's not atoll because it's two to sort of atoll onto its image. Okay, so, uh, but anyway, it's not an immersion, but on geometric points, it is injective. Uh, okay, so, but even though it's not an immersion, it is kind of close to being an immersion. And a theorem that Will was alluding to is, well, tau g is, so this Torelli theorem says it's injective on geometric points, but there's sort of a souped up version which you can ask about the map on tangent spaces. So tau g is, here's a sort of classical theorem, injective on tangent vectors. at a point C, so C is a curve in MG. So when is it injective on tangent vectors? That's true if and only if C is not hyperlyptic. So C is in MG minus HG. Okay, so tau G is not an immersion and it, as, as Nick, Nicholas pointed out, it sort of has no hope of being an immersion on the hyperlyptic locus. Let me try to draw some sort of picture. So here's my MG variety. And inside it, there's this HG. And then there's this map to AG. And somehow these, okay, so it's it's not an immersion on MG, but it is sort of usually a monomorphism, being injective and injective on tangent vectors. And so revised question is, so this is tau G. Revised question. is Fiji an immersion. So Fiji is the map from HG to here. Is Fiji an immersion? And maybe it's worth pointing out, this first, the second issue of being generically two to one goes away because hyperlyptic curves do have automorphisms. They do have this hyperlyptic involution. And so this issue with having even though abelian varieties have two automorphisms, it's also true for hyperlyptic curves, and so that issue goes away. So at least there's some hope that it could be an immersion. Um, yeah, so that's the revised question. So the true the hyperlyptic involution induces minus one on the. That's right. 
Yeah, so it's compatible. Let me let me state the, the let me just tell you the answer right away. So no suspense. Uh, so this is what I learned. This map phi g is an immersion away from characteristic two. So if you invert two, it's an immersion. And also you can say what happens in characteristic two. So in characteristic two, it fails sort of as badly as possible to be an immersion. Uh, so it is not an immersion. So in characteristic two, it is not an immersion. And the map on tangent sp spaces has kernel as big as possible. It's generically inseparable, or sorry, sort of as big as possible. I'll say what I mean later, but um, so character two is not immersion, and the map on tangent spaces has kernel of dimension uh, g minus two at every point, every hyperelliptic curve. Okay, I want to let me just actually to try to whoop um, to try to just give you to rephrase the this question uh, in terms of picture what this Torelli theorem is saying is that uh, sorry what this theorem on tangent spaces is saying is that if we say we have our so we have our mg and we have inside of it a point in hg uh, and we take a, a tangent vector so the tangent vector corresponds to a deformation of the hyperelliptic curve and what this theorem here is saying is that there are some deformations which induce the trivial deformation on the corresponding Jacobian. But the question I'm asking is, is Fijian immersion, are there deformations remaining within the hyperelliptic locus? In other words, can you deform this hyperelliptic curve toward other hyperelliptic curves in a way such that the abelian variety is still, is still sort of constant? It doesn't deform. And what the result is saying is that you can deform them in characteristic not to whenever you deform the hyperelliptic curve to other hyperelliptic curves, the, Jaco the Jacobian also deforms. But in characteristic two, there are actually lots of ways to deform the hyperelliptic curve and not change the Jacobian. Okay, so that's the any questions so far on the just the main thing statement of the theorem. Okay, so now I want to spend a moment telling you about how I learned about this problem. And then I'll go back and sort of, I, and so the, so first I'll tell you about how I learned about this. Then I'll explain this theorem about injectivity on tangent vectors, which is a classical thing, but I think there's some interesting things to say. And then I'll try to describe the idea for this last theorem, the, this result about the hyperelliptic map on, sorry, the trolley map on hyperelliptic curves. I'm oh, sorry, can I ask one question? Yes, please do. So when g equals when g equals two, yes, and characteristic two, yeah, is that does that mean it's an immersion again? Is yes, it, actually, I think in genus two, it's a it's an open immersion. Just a, uh, hg, I believe hg is mg in characteristic two. I mean, sorry, in genus two, and that Torelli map is the it, tau g is pg, and it's an open immersion. Also okay. in characteristic okay. two, yeah. So in particular, if genus is two, then the map on tangent spaces is injective. That's why I assume genus is at least three. This so oh, okay. part, yeah, yeah. Okay. To, otherwise, I just have to say unless genus is two, and then yeah. Good question. Oh, your theorem is okay in any case. The theorem still works. I just for this talk, yeah, in the paper it's stated for genus two as well, but for this talk, I'm just gonna say genus is three and not bother with that. Yeah, any more questions? Okay, well. Feel free to interrupt me. In any case, I wanted to say how I learned about this theorem. So it was actually at a conference uh, organized by to sort of explain a paper by uh, Benson Farr, Mark Kisson, and Jesse Wolfson. And this is some artwork created specially for that conference. And let me just tell you briefly about, so this is just some motivation for how I learned about this question. Let me tell you about this result uh, due to Farr, Kisson, and Wolfson. And their question, they were trying to, they were trying to 
answer Hilbert's 13th question or Hilbert's 13th problem, or at least a version of it. And what their techniques let them understand is this uh, so-called level structure cover of HG. So this HGN means hyperelliptic curve plus an n-torsion line bundle. This is a moduli space. This is a cover, finite covering, finite at all cover. Hyperelliptic curve curve plus n torsion line bundle. And what they showed was that they showed some, it's not so important what it, this means, but they showed that this has essential dimension equal to the dimension of HG. So uh, this essential dimension loosely means that it's this covering space is not pulled back from a covering space of lower dimension. So this has essential dimension equal to the dimension of HG. So uh, if n is odd. OK, so by this, this means another way to say this is uh, this cover, let me call it f sub n, i.e. f sub n is, so this is a finite covering space. And f sub n is not pulled back from a cover in space of lower dimension. That's just, that's their result basically. And, uh, and, but it's false if n is even, or let's say false if n equals two. In other words, it is, it is and this is some classical thing and they pointed this out in the talk but it was also, it seemed like at the time of their talk, maybe it was not so clear exactly why their proof didn't work. They just knew it had, couldn't work because it was previously known for this to be false when n is two. And uh, Rachel Priest was in the audience and she asked the question I really liked, which is what's up with n equals two? And, and just, just to say, what does characteristic two have to do with this? Well, actually, this is a statement over the complex numbers, but um, when n equals two, their proof method, uh, as Benson Favre liked to say, Markissen swooped in with p adic Hodge theory, and it deformed these things over C to things in characteristic dividing n. And so to understand the n equals two thing, they deformed to characteristic two. And so actually this, even though the statement was like some statement over the complex numbers, it was somehow approached via characteristic two, or like characteristic n dividing n. And so I was at this conference, and I thought this question was quite interesting. This was the second to last day of the conference. So that night, I went home to the hotel, and I stayed up until 2 AM and tried to understand what, what was going on in characteristic two that was creating this, their theory, sort of making this essential dimension drop. And it turned, and so I figured it out that, that night late and told them the next day. And it was a lot of fun. But, but just to say, by the way, if this conference was held at IPAM in, in Los Angeles, if you're ever there, I recommend you check out the Bat Cave, which is a room in this IPAM building. It's bigger on the inside. OK. So my next goal is to tell you about this theorem that I mentioned before. So let me just go back for a second. So there are two main remaining things I want to talk about. One is this theorem about injectivity on tangent vectors away from the hyperelliptic locus, and the other is when this map is about why this map is an emergent. Okay. So let me start with this statement on tangent vectors. And in some way, this is a very classical theorem. So let me tell you how this goes. As Will was saying, there's sort of a key lemma to understanding this theorem, which is the following, which is how do you identify the map on tangent spaces? So if you look at sort of the tangent space map at C to, to the Torelli map, that goes from the tangent space at mg to the tangent space at the Jacobian. Tau g, yeah, I'll just write it like this. This is the Jacobian of C, principally polarized. To AG. So this is the map on tangent spaces. 
And it's identified, so the key lemma is that this map is dual to a map on cohomology, which is a map H0 of C omega tensor 2. And there's a map from sim 2 of H0 C omega. This is omega C, I guess. And this is, this is just multiplication. So you take two forms and you tensor them. You get, that's this map. This is multiplication. OK, so that's the, the key lemma, is to just identify this as a multiplication map. And, and now I want to just mention why this lemma implies the theorem, and then I'll make some discussion of this lemma. So in order to see why the lemma implies the theorem, I'll use what the classical Noether's theorem. Noether's theorem says, this is Max Noether, one of the sort of early developments in the theory of curves. It says that, uh, let's say, C hyper is hyperelliptic if and only if, maybe I'll say C is not hyperelliptic if and only if mu is surjective. This is just a class. I mean, it's not. It's not super trivial. It's a very classical uh, result. Okay. So probably now you can see why this lemma, together with Noether's theorem, will imply the theorem. Let me just spell it out. Uh, so key lemma implies theorem. Well, the theorem just says we want to understand when this map on tangent spaces is injective, but dually that's equivalent. So by lemma, we want to understand, want to show mu is surjective if and only if, like <laughs> this is the statement of Noether's here. Mu is surjective if and only if C is not hyperelliptic because mu is surjective is equivalent to tau the tangent space map being injective by the lemma. So this is by the lemma, and this is by Noether's theorem. So just combine them, you get the, you get uh, you get the this theorem statement. And I just want to, because it's kind of nice and geometric, let me just tell you the proof of Noether's theorem in the easy direction. So um, so in other words, y is a for a hyperelliptic curve is mu. Uh, not surjective. So if C is hyperelliptic, why is mu not surjective? So the reason is you can just see it from the classical geometry of the hyperelliptic curve and the canonical embedding. So if you take the hyperelliptic curve, there's a, you, there's a unique line bundle that sort of defines the hyperelliptic map to P1. Uh, and then if you take O of n on P1, or O of G minus one, rather. And that maps it to P G minus one. And then the statement is that this map given, it's given, so this map is given by the G tensor power. That's sort of the definition of this map of L. And this is the canonical map, not the canonical embedding, because it's not an embedding. It maps two to one onto a rational normal curve. So this is the canonical map. And the way you check it, if you haven't seen this, I recommend highly you read chapter 19 of Ravi's book on curves, but it's just, you just check it by writing down. So this is a, L is a line bundle of degree two. So this is a line bundle of degree, degree two G minus two, and it has a G dimensional space of global sections, and that forces it to be the canonical map. Uh, let's just see why it has a G dimensional space of global sections. So H naught of L, this is two dimensional by assumption, and you can sort of say it has two generators, so one and X in here. And then H, then you'll have, if you look at H naught of L tensor G, uh, tensor G minus one, well, at the very least, you have sort of one X, X squared up through X to the G minus one. And so that forces this to be at least G dimensional. And then sort of by Riemann rock, it has to be exactly G dimensional. It has to be the canonical bundle. So this will be G dimensional and these will be the space of global sections. And then if you want to understand this multiplication map, it's now very easy because you're looking at H naught of, uh, so this L tensor G minus one is H naught of omega. 
And so if you want to look at H naught of omega tensor H naught of omega to H naught of omega tensor two, then this sort of just sends one through X tensor the vector space generated, well, X to the, sorry, X to the G minus one through one through X to the G minus one. And when you multiply them, it just goes one through X to the two G minus two. But so that says the image has dimension 2g minus 1. So mu, let me just write on the next page. So image of mu, uh, the dimension is 2g minus 1. But this whole space that remember rock has dimension 3g minus 3, which is the dimension of mg, uh, dim h naught of omega tensor 2 is 3g minus 3. So this map is not suggestive for hyperlocal curve. So it's somehow understood from this geometry of the canonical embedding for the, not the canonical embedding, the canonical map for the hyperlocal curve because it's collapsed here and that sort of forces mu not to be a suggestion. Okay, so any questions, any questions about the idea so far? All right. Well, there's one part remaining, which I want to explain now, which is this key lemma. So how do we do this identification between the map on tangent spaces and the dual, the dual map? Let me spell that out now. Oh, actually, hmm. But you mean 3g minus 3, right? Uh, thank you. Yes, that's a typo. My mistake. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm running a little low on time. So let me, I'll maybe come back to this at the end. But I'll just let me just remark here that often, so there's a version of the Torelli theorem, very nice classical geometry. There's an infinitesimal version of the Torelli theorem that says, so the Torelli theorem says you can recover a curve from this Jacobian, and the infinitesimal Torelli theorem says, well, in many cases, you can recover a curve from just the, the Torelli map on tangent spaces. So off, I'll just say often. Actually, can you see, yeah, can you see that again? What that means? Yeah, let me let me just actually spend a few minutes to explain it. This is uh, this is a fun ge geometric fact. So often can recover C. Just so we know we can recover it from the Torelli map, for, from its image under from its Jacobian. But often we can recover C from just this map tau G, uh, the tangent space to C, on tau G, which is really you know or sort of dually from the map or dually or dually from the map sim2 of h naught of omega of c to h naught of omega tensor 2. And how does this work? Well, this follows from a theorem due to Petrie, or Noether and Riquet's Babbage Petrie. It's a generalization of Max Noether's theorem before, which says uh, if c is if c is a so c is a curve, c is not hyperelliptic. So trigonal. So when you say you can be recovered from this, you're, you're thinking of this as a map, um, as sort of like it's just a map from a sim2 of an, an, a vector space with no particular basis to an, another vector to, to, to vector space. So it's like, it's kind of like a quadratic yeah, I think it's very little data. Uh, yeah, it's basically, what I mean, well, yeah, what we'll see is that the kernel gives us equations in a projective space that yeah. define C. That's basically the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the projective, yeah, that's right. It's, it's very just linear algebraic data. It's like a collection of quadric hypersurfaces in a projective space. Right. Yeah, does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Yeah. Right. Okay. So here's Petrie's theorem. Oh, I better say Petrie's theorem. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Or plain quintic. Now I'm confused. I think I also need, or not a plain quartic as well. Maybe genus is at least four for this. I mean, for, you know, genus, anyway, you can deal with genus three quite easily. It's not an issue. Um, then C, then, so then C into PG minus one by the canonical embedding. Or canonical, yeah, it's an embedding if it's not hyperelliptic, is uh, defined by degree two equations.
And so, right. And in fact, the exceptional cases like trigonal or plain quintics have nice geometry as well. So in the trigonal case, the, it lies on a Hirzebruck surface, which is a surface of minimal degree. In the plain quintic case, it's the one other exceptional, it lies on the one other exceptional surface of minimal degree, which is the two Veronese surface in P5. But in any case, like, so these exceptions have geometric meaning as well, but usually they're defined by degree two equations, which are the kernel of this mu, which are the kernel of mu. So the corollary is the infinitesimal Torelli theorem, which says uh, for C as above, so C, well, it says this thing I was saying here, C can be recovered from mu. This mu should sort of, you know, depends on C from mu C. I've been lazy and not writing that. Okay, so that, that's, you can, uh, yeah, you can, it's kind of nice. There's also this infinitesimal, infinitesimal version of the Torelli theorem. Great. So now I want to go back to this key lemma. So key lemma proof idea. Uh, let me just remind you what it says. So it says that if we have this map from the tangent space of C to MG, to tangent space of the Jacobian, so let me call J the Jacobian of C. So then tangent space to J, uh, AG, this is dual to some map on uh, cohomology, sim2 of h0 omega, c2 h0 omega, c tensor 2, just the multiplication map. OK, so let's, let's try to understand like the proof idea, at least. At least, how do you even identify it? Like, what, why are these things identified with these things? So first, uh, deformation theory tells you that the tangent space to mg is identified with h, h1 of the tangent bundle of c. I'll just omit everything. All cohomology is on c. Uh, OK, well, I'll just keep c. Uh, keep the c. OK, so that's deformation theory. And on the other hand, well, OK, so tau g, this, you sh the deformations of an abelian variety are without the principal polarization are h1 of j pj. If you want to include the principal polarization, it's going to be a subspace of this, which will end up being the sim2. But let me not worry about that for now. So there's, so the tau g is sort of this map from here, from here to here. So let's try to relate this to this sim2 and this to that h dot omega tensor 2. So the, this, to relate this to that, this is sort of just serial duality. So by serial duality, this is h naught of c omega tensor 2 dual. OK, let's follow the other side, which is a bit more involved. So first, what's the tangent? The tangent bundle to an abelian variety, it's sort of, it's a trivial bundle because you can translate it around from the identity. So this is h1 of j oj tensor, a tensor the, the tangent bundle to j is the, you could also say it's the tangent space to j. I'm just sort of writing the tangent space to j. That's the global sections of the tangent bundle. All right, you can pull out this tensor. So that's h1 of j oj tensor h0 of j pj. And now we will have to take some duals. OK, but first, so h1 of j oj is sort of the tangent space to pick of the curve. So it's actually the same as h1. It's not completely trivial, but this is the same as h1 c oc. Uh, tensor h not, and I want to relate this one to c as well. So, well, let me do something kind of trivial. This is the tangent space of the dual of the cotangent space. So I'll take the cotangent space and put a dual. And then finally, the cotangent bundle on the Jacobian is sort of, the global sections are sort of the same as identified isomorphically with the global sections of the curve. So, Wait, so but, sorry, what happened that very last, did you just this put that, this? Did you just put uh, replace the tangent space by the dual of the tangent space and put the dual on the outside? Yep. Yeah, yeah. But they're just global sections. Yeah. It's all it's a vector space because it's uh for the for a billion variety, it's just translates of absolutely something. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you said that. Yeah. Free. Yeah. Free. Yeah. They're all just free vector, they're just free OJ modules. Exactly, exactly. Well, these things are like free modules over whatever base field or over. Yeah. 
That's why I was pointing this out. Yeah, PGA and Omega J. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're free, yeah. All right, and then finally, so then this is, again, ser duality. This is H, uh, H naught of C omega C dual. And this guy is also H naught because the, the map from the differentials on a curve to its Jacobian are, well, this is an isomorphism, the restriction map on a Vitrelli map. Okay, so in the end, we got, we got this map and it's like this. And then if you dualize, you get this map. At least, at least, I don't know, you know, went kind of quickly through these identifications. Any, any questions on, on this? You, so might get, yeah? you might get some question I'm going to ask. Or, uh, like, Great. What's, what's the question? <laughs> OK, so, uh, so there is the obvious, like I agree that, there's a, that, you, that, that gives you a map. Why is a D map do? Uh, this is the question you wanted to ask. Um, Thank you. Yes, I wanted you to ask that question. Uh, let me tell you a story to try to explain. So, so here's a, let me say this map is like alpha. Yeah. Yeah, and then the question you, is, you, just yeah. be clear that other people heard, understood what my oh, question yeah. right away, which is, uh, if this is the sort of thing where in lots of papers by default, people say, of course, dot, 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 uh, you know, and I agree, it must be the map. It's got to be right. But why does that, uh, with, all, with, yeah, with every, all these steps involved, why does it always, uh, <laughs> it, and, and Remy says, by the principle of what else could it be? And I agree with that principle. So it's, uh, yeah. So it's, uh, you're about to be very. You're about to be very ethical. It sounds like. No, no, no. Yeah. So let me let me try to answer that your question with a story. So the question is, why is this alpha or this tangent space of the curly map dual to mu? Like it's it's. And I'll let me say to Remy, one thing it could be is minus one times it. For example, it could be a composition of that with minus one. So to answer Ravi's question, let me relate it to another question. Is this like a Halloween? Is this like a Halloween theme talk? Um. Is that what something. Brian Conrad makes you think of? <laughs> Scared of Brian Conrad? I don't know. Um, there will be some Halloween spirit in the end, hopefully. Let's see. So this is related to another question. Let me tell you this other question. You, you'll see it's quite, it sounds similar. Uh, so on the one hand, you have H1 of J, O, J. This is like, as we're seeing here, this is sort of the, the tangent space to pick, tangent space to J. Whoops, maybe J backwards. And on the other hand, so this is dual to the cotangent space, J omega J. This is dual. These are like the tangent space and the cotangent space. And on the other hand, we have H1. This is just the pairing on TJ and TJ dual. On the other hand, we have H1 of COC. And by ser duality, this is dual to H naught of C omega C. And then these, there's some natural maps between these that are like, you can map the curve to the Jacobian and, and identify these, it turns out. And so the question is, does this commute? Uh, there's two natural pairings. It's like, are these pairings identified in the natural way? And so there's a, there's a, and yeah, Brian Conrad asks, does this commute? And so, I mean, why did he ask this? Well, there's this article in Arithmetic Geometry, the Arithmetic Geometry book by Cornell Silverman, article by Milne on Jacobian varieties, and it stated there that this diagram commutes. And Brian was a diligent grad student at the time, and he was trying to solve, it stated as an exercise left to the reader, but a difficult exercise. And he couldn't figure it out, actually. But he was quite curious about it. So later, as a postdoc, um, as a postdoc, he was at Harvard and he went by MIT where Johan Dian was and he asked Johan, like I couldn't figure out this exercise in Milne, like do you have any idea why this diagram commutes? And Johan thought about it for a while, but he couldn't come up with a solution. So then- Oh, uh, it's definitely a Halloween theme to talk. It's Halloween, why is it Halloween theme? No, I'm just, you got all these scary people. <laughs> oh, I don't, okay, I hope they're not too scary. But... They're just joking. I'm gonna <laughs> have my friendly. Like all these people. All right. Well, yeah. So we asked Sarah. Sarah visited Harvard, and Sarah said uh, he asked Sarah, and Sarah thought about it a bit. They went to a blackboard, and he filled up this whole blackboard with chalk. But in the end, they couldn't figure it out. But then Brian went to a conference with uh, Ofer Gaber, the original OG, and he said, 
And Brian thought to himself, now is my chance to find the answer to the commutativity of this diagram. And so Brian asked Ofer, and two amazing things happened. So first, well, Ofer thought for about, he stared up at the ceiling for about five seconds. And then first, he pointed out something which these other experts had missed, which is that actually the question isn't well-defined. It's only well-defined up to a sign because this identification of H1 with the tangent space to pick de depends on a convention for check cohomology, which is about like if you take the boundary map between two overlaps, you sort of do the first and the inverse of the second, or the second and the inverse of the first. But Ofer said, all right, there's just some standard convention, so you have to pick the standard convention. And then, and then he said, and then I have this uh, additional, so fixing that convention, now here's the idea for how to approach this question. And the idea, in my understanding, is basically this, you can rephrase this commutativity as like some other commutative diagram. And that the commutativity of that diagram, it'll be a map of some global cohomology group. So, um, but you can rephrase it as H1 of a map of sheaves commuting. And to check whether H1 of a map of sheaves commuting, you reduced it to a local question. And then you can check that at points on the reduced curves. And that you can like use the compatibility of the tangent space and cotangent space between C and J to understand. So just to summarize, the idea is basically to relate this globe. So this shared duality is somehow a global phenomenon, and this duality on the Jacobian is a local phenomenon. There's this mismatch between them, but you can relate the global phenomena to a local phenomena phenomena by replacing sort of the global cohomology by a map of sheaves community. And the upshot is that when Brian went home and worked out the commutativity, it does not commute. It, um, to answer Brian Conrad, no, only, it's actually off by a minus one sign. So where did you say there was a convention? Yeah, mm -hmm. so if Wait, you took the standard convention, then it would be off by a minus one sign. If you sort of flip the convention, then it would be correct. But where, where did the convention come in? Which of these maps? Um, it's on? this. It's the identification of this with pick of uh, C, the tangent space to pick. The title, because this is really like a check code. Like, how do you identify the, what is the tangent space to pick of a curve? You, you, like, you, it's like, sorry, I, this is, um, it's like a pick of, pick of the curve is H1 of C, GM. And then you have to identify the tangent space to pick with H1 of CO or CJ, and that identification depends, it's like a check cohomology and depends on the sort of sign. Sorry, so it's in the, but wait, is this one of the maps of this? Of the, of this no, it's sort of, um, or is that, it seems it's, like- It's, it's in wait. this isomorphism because you, this isomorphism to, it's really coming from a tangent space and cotangent space pairing in it. And to identify the tangent space with this H1 check and the cotangent space with this, that depends on the sort of does that make sense? Um, OK, so you're saying that to have the isomorphism between that, OK. Uh, the isomorphism, the, this isomorphism is really coming from a pairing on Tj uh, with Tj with its cotangent, the tangent space to j of the identity with a cotangent space. Be like the base field. And to make this identification with H1 of J O J, this isomorphism is a thing that depends on the choice of sign. And then uh, so so implicitly this map all these these map this map here depend on the choice of sign. So this depends on sign. OK, well, if you want to read more about it, I encourage you to look at growth in, uh, Brian's book on growth and equality, Appendix B4. I guess I could just ask him, but is this the er is this the issue that led to that book existing, or was it a different? Topic? I think it might be, but yeah, you should ask him if you want to be sure. I think this is what you're talking about. OK. okay. Good. So that was that was that. And now I can get to the result I proved, which is this. What about what happens when we restrict the hyperelliptic curves? Um, oh, I guess I, let me just say before that, 
Um, so then the, the proof for this lemma identification on tangent spaces follows similar lines, and you can use it to identify alpha actually with a dual to mu. There's no sign here. It's actually dual. Yes, but which convention of a check homology are you using? There's, there's, I don't think there's a, let me think. I, uh, oh yeah, I I'm not, sh okay. I have to think if there is a convention here. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me duck that question. I, I feel like it might not be, but if I am using the convention, it's the standard convention, which is the same one in this other case. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? All right. Okay, so just to remind you what the main theorem was, uh, you have this map phi g from hyperelliptic curves to abelian varieties, the Torelli map, and it's an immersion away from characteristic two, but in characteristic two, it's not an immersion. And the proof has two steps, so proof idea. So the first step is to analyze the map on tangent spaces. And at first, I thought this was the only step because basically I was thinking if you know a map is like injective on tangent spaces and injective on points by the Torelli, classical Torelli theorem tells you that, then it's a monomorphism. And then, well, you know, a monomorphism should be an immersion. At least a proper monomorphism is an immersion. Uh, that's a true statement. But this map from HG to AG is not proper. And because there, you know, it's uh, you can kind of sometimes degenerate. You can get sort of uh, more, for instance, in genus two, you can have like products of elliptic curves are abelian varieties, which are in the closure of the hyperelliptic locus, but are not coming from, they're sort of coming from reducible genus or two curves. Uh, so, so that's the first step. But I, so I thought that was the only step, but I actually sent it to Brian Conrad and he pointed out, no, you actually have to still show it's an immersion. And so the second step is to then check it's an immersion. So there's a discussion on chat. So by immersion, yep. you now mean locally closed immersion. It's always, I always meant locally closed immersion. Yeah, and, yeah. it's and always locally closed. Thank you. And, you. and then you made a statement about proper something, something, something. Okay. Uh, a true statement is that uh, a proper monomorphism is a closed immersion, but this map is not proper. <laughs> Check immersion over Z1 half. Yeah. So. I want to focus on two. I think like one is kind of fun, but it's it's like a just a tangent space calc. It's some calculation with these eight these cohomology groups, and maybe left better left not for a talk. So I'll focus on two. Is Ofer Gaber going to come up in the story again? Uh, not Ofer, but we will have two one recurring character and another fun new character. All right. So let me tell you let me tell you how I learned about this way to check it's an immersion. So to, to check its immersion over z a half, you can use the so-called valuative criterion for locally closed immersions. And this was due to Shinichi Mochizuki. And I learned about it from Brian Conrad. He and he learned about it when he was in the Michigan Math Library. So he was browsing through books. He, he wasn't looking for anything in particular. He was just sort of opening books and reading random parts of them. And he happened to see this fascinating book on the foundations of P-adic Teichmuller theory by Moshizuki. And so he opened up, he was just browsing through and eventually got to page 100. And lo and behold, there it was, the valuative criterion for locally closed immersions in this book by Moshizuki. And well, okay, I promised in the abstract to tell you about Brian's library app idea. So, uh, in Brian, from Brian's perspective, it, there's a lot of value in just sort of going to libraries and browsing the books because you might find nice things you would never expect, like this beautiful valuative criterion. And so Brian's idea for his app was to create an app where you could virtually, you could sort of virtually choose books to be in your personal library on your device, and then you could choose when you, you could browse the sections and then in the library and then choose particular books to kind of take off the shelves, and then you could browse the books. That was based to have like a virtual library was basically his idea, but he investigated it further and found it was basically not legally feasible. So the app idea has died. But in any case, he did find this valuative criterion for immersions. So I want to tell you about that. And what let, let's just say, try to motivate it. So what what is this valuative criterion? So we want 
a criterion for locally closed immersions. So first, what's the value of criterion for closed immersions? Can anyone tell me what the value of criterion for closed immersions is? What are the hypotheses? Yeah, OK. I mean, it's basically like, yeah, well, let's try to set it up. So say you have a map x to y, which is a monomorphism. And we want some sort of criterion for when a, so t equals spec of a DVR. And we want some criterion if we have like a map from t to y. It's so, you know, we, I want to set it up like the value of criterion for properness or separateness or any of these things. Uh, and some conditions, like when will we get a map? Like um, when is f a proper, when is f a closed immersion? I was going to say, didn't you basically tell us that that's if and only if f is proper? Yeah, exa uh, that's right. That's right. So I'll, let me just say, exactly. Thank you. So, uh, so let me say uh, f. So because uh, proper is equivalent to closed monomorphism, uh, to closed, proper monomorphism is equivalent to closed immersion. By the way, monomorphism means injective on points and tangent vectors. Wait, uh, sorry. You, is that yeah. true? Okay. Uh, is yeah, that true? this is like oh, in uh, EGA. Okay. 18, what do you mean? Okay, I don't remember reference. Is that the usual? Or 18.12 point something. I don't remember. Yeah, it's some standard fact. I hope I'm not misstating this, but. Uh, let's discuss it in questions if I'm wrong. So proper monomorphism is equivalent to closed immersion. And so the value of criterion for closed immersions, given being a monomorphism, is just the value of criterion for properness. So it's just like if you have this A is the generic point and generic point S is the closed point, uh, it, the value of criterion for closed immersions is if you have T mapping to Y and A to mapping to X, then the map from the from the DBR factors through X. This so this exists and is unique if and only if F is a closed immersion. Okay. Does anyone know the value of criterion for open immersions? Is it now? This I, yeah. Go ahead. Can you just cross out generic point and put special point? Exactly, that's right. So value of criterion for closed immersions, for open immersions, so this is, is the same thing with the closed point. So this is the value of criterion for open immersions. This, this diagram meets, or the T lifts, if and only if, so again, F is a monomorphism, then this is true if and only if F is open immersion. So it's just the same sort of analog. All right, so now we're up to the value to the criterion for locally closed immersions. I, I just wanted to say, I mean, we assume some finite type uh, properties here, right? Otherwise, yeah, 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 that's right. So okay. I've kind of I it. probably I'm need like no Syrian, finite type. That's right. So if you want the exact hypotheses, I even have a version for stack. You can look in Moshizuki's book. If you want the version for stacks, I put it in my paper on hyperelliptic curves that's linked in this talk abstract. Um, yeah, does anyone have a guess for this? What should it be for locally closed immersion? So we have, let's say, uh, x to y is a monomorphism. T is this spectrum of a DBR. And we have maps from t to y, x to y. So what is an immersion? It's basically something that's like an open immersion and then a closed immersion. So for this, su suppose we have the closed point and the generic point mapping to x. Then given this data, there exists a unique lift of t, it's kind of like you combine both of them or take, yeah. Uh, this is this holds and like plus finite type and the theory and hypotheses for an x and y. Then uh, this is holds if and only if, if and only if x to y is a locally closed immersion. So if you, yeah. All right, well, we're almost out of time, so let me just try to indicate to you how the proof would, how we can use this value criterion to check that the, this Torelli map is an immersion over Z a half. 
from HG. This goes from HG to HG. Let me just set it up for you. So want to apply a value to a criterion. So how do you set this up? Well, we have this eta and the closed point mapping to H. We have our value, our, our spec T. T is our DVR. And we have sort of its closed point and generic point mapping to hyperopic curves. And T will map to AG. So what does this correspond to? This map alpha, alpha gives us a, a family of principally polarized abelian varieties over T. And we also are given, so we're given this abelian variety over T. And we know that sort of the special fiber of A is, okay, so this beta, beta gives us a, a curve CS and gamma gives us a curve C eta. And we know that the special fiber of A is the Jacobian of CS and the generic fiber of A is the Jacobian of C eta. And we want to show, like we're trying to show this map is an immersion. So we want to show T lifts to HG. So we want a family of hyperelliptic curves, a family C over T of hyperelliptic curves with the Jacobian of C equals A, isomorphic to A. If you could check this, then by the evaluative criterion, this would be a locally closed immersion, tau G. So this, by evaluative criterion, producing Uh, such a C would imply tau G is an immersion. All right, so I'll just, I'm going to, I'll stop now. Let me just say one more second about the idea. The idea would is that if we can show, so we could sort of uh, use, you could use that HG goes into MG bar. Uh, we can use the we can use the fact that mg bar is proper to extend the generic point to a curve, but possibly singular over the DVR. And then we want to show that, in fact, that curve is smooth. You have to make some argument. And then the Torelli theorem would tell you that if the curve is smooth and the closed point has this, this Jacobian, which is the same as the hyperelliptic curve, then it has to, in fact, be the hyperelliptic curve. So we use this. So use this to extend eta to hg to eta to mg to map t to mg bar, then show it factors through mg, show delta factors through mg, and then use Torelli theorem to say it actually has to be in uh, that same hyperelliptic curve, use Torelli, the classical Torelli theorem. OK, well, I'll stop there. Let me just say, so summarizing briefly, the idea was we wanted to understand the map, this Torelli map restricted to, we wanted to understand whether this Torelli map was an immersion when restricted to the hyperelliptic locus. And the basic idea of the proof was you first check it's a monomorphism by analyzing some maps on tangent spaces and then use this value criterion. And so in the spirit of Halloween, just to conclude, if you've seen the Saturday Night Live sketch, uh, did you see my pumpkin? I'm Dave. I'm David S. Pumpkins. Any questions? <laughs>